In the game we showed at the beginning of the first segment of this video on domineering, this was the position after move 11 by blue. After removing the played out squares, we see that the board is divided into two separate regions. A big region in the north and a moderate sized region in the south. Then the next move, move 12 by red, further divides the big north into subregions one of which we'll now call the north, denoted by the letter N, and the other which we'll call the east, denoted by the letter E. And of course we'll still have the south, which we'll now denote by the letter S. So after move 12, the new position is now the sum, N plus E plus S. This sort of partition is very common in domineering. At some stage, the position breaks up into pieces, which then in turn break up into smaller pieces. Our grand plan is to study each of the smaller pieces and find properties of them from which we can deduce further properties. The most important simple property of any game, whether it be small or large, is who can win. This might or may not depend on who plays next. We've said that a game G is positive if L can win, no matter who plays next, or zero if either player can win, if his opponent has to move first, or negative if R can win, no matter who goes first, or fuzzy if either player can win if he plays first. If left can win, it is either because the game is positive, in which case it doesn't matter who plays next, or zero, in which case left can win, only because he's allowed to play second. So combining these two cases, we say that left going second can win, if and only if the game G is greater than or equal to zero. Left going second is equivalent to right going first. So if right plays first, the game is greater than or equal to zero if left can win or not greater than or equal to zero if right can win. Similarly, if right goes second, meaning that left goes first, then right can win if and only if the game is less than or equal to zero. So we have this summary of the outcomes with correct play. In the first column, the next mover is right, and the outcome depends on whether the game is greater than or equal to zero. In the second column, the next mover is left, and the outcome depends on whether or not the game is less than or equal to zero. How do these elementary properties extend to sums? The answer is provided by the following elementary theorem. If two games, G and H, are each greater than or equal to zero, then their sum, G plus H, is also greater than or equal to zero. To illustrate this theorem, we consider two general domineering games, G and H. Let's assume both are greater than or equal to zero. That's the hypothesis of our theorem. Our goal is to show their conclusion, which is then their sum is also necessarily greater than or equal to zero. Here's the proof. The theorem is relevant only if right plays first, and so without loss of generality, we can assume that he plays his red domino in H, changing it to H prime. Since he had no winning move in H alone, H prime cannot be less than or equal to zero. That means that left now has a winning move in H prime alone, which he can now play. That changes H prime to H double prime, a game in which left going second can win. So our theorem has survived an arbitrary first move by Wright. But Wright might continue by playing his next red domino in G, changing it to G prime. But since there was no winning red move in G prime alone, left must now have a winning move, which changes G prime to G double prime, which is again greater than or equal to zero. So we've seen that however Wright tries to destroy the hypothesis of our theorem, left has a response, 
which restores these hypotheses. Since this process can be continued until Wright has no more moves, the theorem is proved. Similarly, we could also show that if two games are each less than or equal zero, then so is their sum. If a game is equal to zero, then it is both less than or equal to zero and greater than or equal to zero. From this, it follows that adding a zero game to any other game does not change its value. So our definitions of positive, negative, and zero games are consistent with how the same mathematical signs behave when applied to more familiar objects such as numbers. We'll next show that rotations yield negatives. We'll illustrate this by considering the south as a particular example. If we rotate it by 90 degrees, we obtain another game called the rotated south. Now let's consider playing the sum of the rotated south plus the south, or using their nicknames, rotated s plus s. We observe that every blue move in rotated south corresponds to a red move in south, and vice versa. Similarly, every blue move in S corresponds to a red move in rotated S, and vice versa. Hence, wherever the first player plays, his opponent can find a matching move in the opposite game. This preserves the matchings even if the pieces eventually decompose until the first player eventually runs out of moves. Hence, the second player can win in the sum of rotated S plus S. And the same matching method would work on any domineering game. Of course, any game is equal to itself. So, if we add minus S to both sides of this equation, we conclude that the rotated S is the negative of S. In this way, we can extend the notions of equals, greater than, less than, as well as not greater than and not less than, to comparisons of non-zero games. We'll next show that reflections of domineering positions don't change their values.